Hello and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. I'm your host, Leah Rosen, the online editor for Bioprocess International. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be made available for replay in the multimedia section of our website. We've muted the audio lines, but you're welcome to type in your questions for our speaker and the question and answer on your screen. After the presentation, we will begin the question and answer portion and I will ask our speakers your questions. Your questions in the question and answer window will only be visible to myself and our speakers. So thank you for joining us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers, Kristen O'Neill and William Tran from Merck and Kevin Mullen from Thermo Fisher Scientific. Hello, on behalf of my colleague Will and myself, I'd like to start by thanking BPI for the opportunity to share our work. Today we'll be discussing our performance evaluation of Thermo Scientific's DynaDrive sub for perfusion applications. We'll start with a brief introduction to share some background on the motivation and scope of our evaluation, and then spend the majority of the time discussing our observations and results, including operational ease of use, cell culture performance in high density perfusion, and safe cell-free KLA characterization studies. If you already have subs in your network, why might you be interested in new technology? Well, single-use bioreactors have been a key driver in the transformative shift toward single-use technology across the bioprocessing industry over the last nearly two decades. Much of the first-generation sub-technology was developed for less intense fed batch production, which was the primary application at the time. Now the industry is seeing a shift towards greater use of very high density culture, both in intensified fed batch and perfusion applications, and intensified culture densities may face oxygen transfer limitations. Additionally, while I'm sure first generation systems considered safety and ergonomics in their design, a decade or two of real world use has identified areas where customers would like to see improvement. So what was our goal? As we look to preparing for the decades to come, we wanted to explore what next-generation sub-technology offers, particularly with a line of sight to supporting high-density perfusion cultures. Vendors put together rich data packages around the launch of new technology, so what was our driver to bring a demo unit in-house? We think there are a few advantages to supplementing vendor data packages with internal experience, including the opportunity to use our own cell line as well as our own media for KLA characterization. And while pictures and videos are extremely helpful, getting hands-on experience is the best way to get a feel for the ergonomics of the system. Later in today's webinar, Kevin from Thermo will share more detailed specifications of the DynaDrive line. So here I just want to highlight some of what resonated with us in terms of potential customer value. On the left, you'll see a few specifications of the DynaDrive. Some areas where we could see these features bringing value are Improved power input and mixing time characteristics are in line with the goal of supporting higher densities, and higher reported KLAs could provide the ability to run both fed batch and perfusion in the same hardware. Leveraging higher turndown ratios to run multiple stages in a single reactor can reduce the number of bags loaded and removed, as well as the number of systems needed in a facility, together improving both operational and facility efficiency and flexibility. Safer and more efficient BPC installation and removal is a desire we hear from colleagues across our network. Additionally, having a product line up to 5,000 liters with improved gas transfer and mixing could allow for the use of the same technology over a larger range of our facility network, simplifying process transfer from research to manufacturing. To further assess these potential advantages in hands-on evaluation, we brought the 50-liter DynaDrive to our labs in Kenilworth, New Jersey for a few months. The focus of our assessment centered around ergonomics, process control and automation, and mass transfer. We wanted to get feedback ranging from packaging and storage of the BPC, bag loading and setup, to daily operations. With the growing PAT trend across the industry, we wanted to get a sense for the ease of integration of external PAT sensors and the capability and reliability to set up control loops of strong interest to perfusion applications, such as level control and automated cell bleeding. And finally, with our focus being on high density applications, we wanted to get data on the ability to support intensified cell densities with acceptable dissolved oxygen and carbon dioxide levels. For the cell culture phase of the evaluation, we had a high cell density target with an aggressive ramp up of the perfusion rate to four VVD at a full 50 liter working volume. We used an ATF-6 with one backup filter and leveraged an automated cell bleed. For the KLA characterization phase of the evaluation, we followed the 80-20 gassing out method with culture media. 
We'll kick off our evaluation feedback with some highlights on operational and ergonomic improvements. For starters, the Dyna Drive improves bag loading in two ways. On the far left, you see a first generation sub where you load the bag through the top, pulling certain lines through openings in the bottom. Just to the right, you can see the Dyna Drive at the same scale. With the fully opening front door, the bag slides right in. Channels in the bottom open to the front so that the sparge and harvest lines slip into place. The second way in which the bag is easier to load is that there is no longer a shaft to install. Installation of a shaft at 50 liters isn't too bad, but it becomes more inconvenient at larger scales. On the far right, you can see a sequence showing the simple interface between the agitator hub on the top of the BPC to the motor assembly. You slide the hub into the holder, pull the lever to lock the connection in place, and close the cover. On the 50 liter, that happens easily at shoulder height, but we had the opportunity to view prototypes at Thermos facility demonstrating the mechanical lifts that will enable this step to occur at ground level, even on the 5,000 liter system. The next area where we saw improvements in operational ease of use of the system was around port locations on the BPC. First, the Dyna Drive harvest is at a true low point in the bottom of the BPC. In some first generation subs, the harvest port has a suboptimal location, limiting the amount of volume that can be recovered by gravity or pump without manipulation of the BPC inside the shell. The harvest port on the Dyna Drive enables greater batch recovery with essentially no manual intervention. The Dyna Drive shell is designed with many access points to the BPC on the front from the top to the bottom. This greatly increases the options for potential port locations on the bag. We think this makes the BPC flexible to current and future needs for probes, perfusion connections, and addition lines. The final observation we want to share on operational use is with regard to simple aids to ensure optimal BPC orientation in the shell. The Dyna Drive could have had a more rigid front door covering more of the BPC, but that would have reduced flexibility for future port locations. To help ensure the BPC maintains the optimal shape with the current design, there are simple 3D printed anchors that you install to prevent the bag from slouching down inside the shell. There is also an easy to attach foam probe holder to ensure the probe is always at a 90 degree angle, ensuring no interference with the drivetrain. Now let's look at our experiences with process control and automation during the evaluation. The demo unit came with a G3 Lite controller with Finesse True Bio Delta V. Without any customization before arrival, we were able to set up BNC for remote connection via OPC. This was important to us as it enabled the editing and tuning of control loops remotely, as well as access to the local Delta V historian trends. You can see one such plot on the left. The focus here is on the green trend, which is the vessel weight, oscillating rapidly due to the alternating flow of the ATF controller, and the blue trend, which is the media in pump for our perfusion media. This is a visual representation demonstrating some of the automation capabilities for perfusion and continuous culture. In this example, showing the level control by regulating media flow into the tank. We utilized a calculation configuration to apply a control equation in order to mitigate noise from the ATF oscillations in the vessel weight that we might have seen using only set point control. The user interface was simple enough for operators to navigate and adjust perfusion flow rate parameters in the control equation. You can see when the VBD step changes occurred, the pump rapidly adjusted to the new rate with minimal disturbance to the level control. The other aspect around automation capabilities for perfusion and continuous control that we wanted to evaluate was the ability to interface a third party PAT sensor and utilize that signal in a control loop. During the evaluation, we successfully brought in the value from a Hamilton ArcView transmitter by a four to 20 milliamp input and couple the capacitance reading from the InSight probe to an onboard pump. This enabled us to automate the cell bleed to maintain a target cell density. The level control discussed previously also included compensating for this bleed out with additional media in. On the trend to the left, the red line is the capacitance value. The purple is the bleed pump that was activated when the capacitance was over the set point. The blue is the media in pump, which would need to compensate for the increased bleed. And the green line is the vessel volume, which is targeted to maintain at approximately 50 liters. The remote access to the controller and historian was critical to adjusting the control loop parameters. You can see the first time the bleed kicked on, it resulted in a sharp drop in both capacitance and vessel volume. Adjustments to the control loop resulted in successfully implementing bleed control. 
where the kicking on no longer resulted in significant disturbance to the level control and maintained a more level capacitance around the target value. Now I'll hand things over to my colleague Will to discuss the results of the mass transfer aspects of our evaluation, both in cell culture and cell-free KLA characterization. Thanks, Kristen. I'll start with the cell culture results on the left figure. Our focus for this run was to test the capacity of the bioreactor at high cell density conditions, and so the process we ran had a more aggressive perfusion ramp-up than we would normally use. The ramp-up schedule is on the bottom right figure, getting up to 4 VBD by day 12. The process adjustment does mean that we don't have a direct comparison to another vessel from historical data, but that data is still being generated. In any case, we were able to reach our target cell density of 200 million cells within 15 days while maintaining a viability above 80%. On the right-hand side, you'll see continuous data for DO control, and with the DO reading in green, air sparge in red, and oxygen sparge in blue. For the mass transfer of the system, we found that surface transfer was able to support the DO set point until day three at four million cells. We were also using a predetermined step-up in air sparge to manage PCO2 levels, ramping from zero to five liters per minute, and that background air provided enough oxygen to support the DO set point until day seven at 40 million cells, where we finally started sparging oxygen. By the time we got to our peak density of 212 million cells per mil, the oxygen sparge was about 3.75 liters per minute, or about 70% of the mass flow controller's range, so there was still some more room to grow. One of the most interesting things we noted was how well the Dynadrive was able to strip CO2. Our pH control strategy was to maintain within a dead band using only air sparge and to trying to avoid utilizing base addition. Here we have a comparison with another vessel of the same scale. The cell line, media, and set points were the same, but the perfusion rates were slightly different and the control strategies were based on the vessel's limitations. On the left, at low VCDs, both the vessels were able to maintain a similar PCO2 range, but in the lower left graph, the alternative sub requires more total gas flow to maintain the oxygen set point. At high VCDs on the right, the alternative sub sends pure oxygen through a fit sparger to be able to supply enough mass transfer, whereas the Dynadrive continues using a mixture of air and oxygen through a drilled hole sparger. The loss of air as a carrier gas leads to lower PCO2 stripping in the alternative sub, and even when the gas total flow rates are similar, that leads to faster PCO2 accumulation in the top right graph. Overall, the 50-liter Dynadrive has PCO2 levels consistent with what is being seen in our Amber 250 and 2-liter vessels, and that's impressive. We also did some in-house KLA testing with actual culture media, and we were curious about the effect that a perfusion device might have on mass transfer. After all, we're recirculating one whole vessel volume on the order of a few minutes. So we ran varying conditions of power input per unit volume air sparge, and ATF recirculation rate in the DOE with about 70 total conditions. You can see the range of inputs in this table here, 0 to 60 watts per cubic meter, 0 0.01 to 0 0.06 VBM sparge, and with or without ATF recirculation. So this is the correlation equation we got. The coefficient for power input was almost 0.5, and the coefficient for sparge rate was 0 0.8. You can see the leverage plots below, and it turns out that the ATF has a small but measurable impact on the KLA, but as expected, nowhere near the effect that power input or sparging did. It was also nice to see that the power input and sparge rate effects were linear over the range that we tested. In terms of more interpretable results, these contour plots on the left show the actual measured KLA values, both for the drodal sparger and an optional fritch sparger that we did not end up using in the cell culture run. For the drodal sparger, we got KLA numbers over 25 inverse hours for our tested range and over 45 inverse hours when using the frit. On the right is a contour plot extrapolating to the rest of the operable range, and with a drill hole sparger, we would be up to about 55 inverse hours. The star shows a theoretical capacity, if sparging pure oxygen, to give a rough estimate of our capacity at 220 million cells. 
We also did some oxygen transfer rate calculations for the mixed gas composition of air and oxygen, but the numbers weren't all that different. As we noted in our circulture run, there's still room to grow past our target of 200 million cells per mil. So overall, the diamond drive has demonstrated that it has the capacity to support more intensified cell culture processes that we're developing and has the flexibility to incorporate advanced control strategies that would be needed alongside them. Especially in ergonomics, we noted increased flexibility and operational use of the system. From a process controller perspective, we were able to integrate third-party PAT tools and utilize them with advanced control strategies. And for mass transfer, we were happy to see the wide range of power input available to us, as well as the linearity of KLA response. During high-density cell culture, the ability to provide oxygen supply and CO2 removal were able to match the needs of our process and still have room for more intensification. So far, the results are promising, and we're looking forward to seeing data from the larger scales as it becomes available. With that, I'd like to acknowledge the colleagues that were instrumental in generating this data and to thank you for your attention. We're happy to take any questions at the end, but for now, I'll hand it over to Kevin for more detailed information about the DynaDrive. Thank you, Kristen and Will. That was a great presentation. I'm impressed with the insights you shared about your experience with using the DynaDrive. It was great to learn more about your experience with the DynaDrive and also the results that you obtained. Thank you for sharing the experience with us. Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin Mullen. I am the, the director of the DynaDrive product line. I want to take a few minutes and discuss more about the DynaDrive and highlight a few more of the features and benefits of this next generation single-use bioreactor. Some of you may be wondering why Thermo Fisher Scientific made a next generation single-use bioreactor. After all, Thermo Fisher Scientific has been providing single-use bioreactors since 2006 and has over 1,400 installed globally. Well, we, like Merck, were seeing some changes occurring in our industry. Either it was a need to support intensified cell cultures, as exemplified by Merck in the previous presentation, or the need to maintain flexible multi-product facilities to allow bioreactors to be flexible, scalable, and efficient. And also there's a need for larger single-use bioreactors larger than, than 2,000 liters. As many processes go from clinical to commercial phase, we found that users would like to stay within single use, but often cannot due to capacity or performance constraints. Therefore, we sought to create a new reactor that could meet all of these needs. We created the DynaDrive. This project has been in the works for nearly four years and we are excited to report that all sizes are launched and now available. The DynaDrive reactor has five key benefits that I will highlight throughout my presentation, and also Kristen and Will highlighted in their presentation as well. The first benefit is best-in-class performance in power, mixing, and mass transfer. As presented by Kristen and Will, they were looking for a reactor that had the ability to support high cell densities, and that is accomplished with high yet efficient power and mass transfer, we're able to see similar performances at all scales, even up to 5,000 liters. The second benefit is efficient facility footprint. As you can see in the CAD images on the right, the DynaDrive is not only the 50 liter, but we offer a 500 liter, 3,000 liter, and 5,000 liter sizes as well. All sizes fit in a relatively small footprint, you can see in, in some subsequent slides that I present that the 50 liter is a great scale down model for all sizes. Also that the 3000 liter can fit in the same footprint and ceiling height requirement as our current legacy 2000 liter reactor. Therefore, it can be used in most facilities that are built for 2000, reactor, 2000 liter reactors today. The third benefit is the impeccable seed train turndown ratio that allows for more streamlined and efficient seed train processes. I'll cover that in an upcoming slide. Fourth, we've designed all sizes to have a lift mechanism to help facilitate BPC loading or bioprocessing container loading. The 50 and 500 have a bit of a simplified lift mechanism that is manually operated, but the 3,000 liter and 5,000 liter 
Both have lift mechanisms that allow the BPC to be fully connected and loaded at ground level, thus reducing the time users spend at the top of the reactor and also facilitating faster load and unload times of the BPC. Fifth, as mentioned by Merck, we designed the hardware with the future in mind. There's quite a bit of space for sensors and connectors that are used today, but other connectors and sensors may come in the future as well. So we wanted to make sure there was space in the hardware to facilitate such connections. Kristen did a great job highlighting some of the key benefits of the 50 liter hardware. So I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but just know that a lot of thought around ergonomics went into the design to make sure that it was easy to load and unload the bioprocessing containers, or BPCs as we call them. And similar features are designed in the 500, 3000, and 5000 liter DynaDrive hardware units as well. We do have standard BPCs which utilize the thermoscientific Aegis 514 film. These standard designs have now been used by uh, nearly 20 customers in various processes, and we have found that this, standard, that this standard fits almost all applications. We are also using single-use sensors and foam probes in the standard design. The, the 50 liter uh, standard BPC design, we have, we have two standard designs. One, the, the one I showed on the previous slide is our, our standard for fed batch processes, and then this standard design is our standard for perfusion processes. Uh, it is similar to the one I just showed. We, we've just included a one inch port in the middle of the BPC to facilitate the connection to the ATF filter. Merck used a design very similar to this one. It just had some minor customizations on the line sets. We will continue to customize BPCs as needed, but are also confident that our standards will meet almost all application needs. I'm showing the 50 liter standard BPC, but we have similar designs for the 500 liter, 3000 liter, and 5000 liter as well. We've talked enough about the 50 liter DynaDrive. Let's move on to the larger sizes. This slide shows you in relative dimensions the differences between the existing 2000 liter reactor and the new 3000 liter and 5000 liter DynaDrive reactors. Mainly, I want to point out how the 3000 liter DynaDrive shown in the light blue box on the right side, has a slightly lower required ceiling height than the ceiling height required for our existing 2,000 liter reactor. The 3,000 liter DynaDrive is around 12 feet tall. That means the 3,000 liter DynaDrive will be able to fit in the same spot where an existing 2,000 liter sits today. Therefore, boosting capacity by 50% and not taking up more space in the production area. You can see that the 5,000 liter is a bit taller, roughly 16 feet tall, and may be more suitable for greenfield opportunities where a facility may need to be built. Now let's take a deeper dive into the DynaDrive technology. Inside the BPC is a multi-impeller drivetrain. The drivetrain is flexible when not deployed in the reactor, allowing packaging to be quite small and compact. However, when the BPC is loaded in the hardware, the drivetrain becomes rigid it is held in the top by the motor and the bottom is held in place by utilizing a blind bearing port. As Merck demonstrated, the corners of the BPCs are held by tab holders. Through many studies, including empirical data and CFD modeling, it was determined that we can achieve the best mixing performance for the height and shape of the reactor by having multiple two-bladed impellers and a bottom sweep impeller. The sweep propeller allows for incredible turndown ratio that I spoke about previously. This technology enables a 10 to 1 turndown ratio in the 50 liter, which means you can see the reactor with as little as 5 liters. The 500 liter and 5,000 liter units can be seated with 25 liters and 250 liters respectively, yielding a 20 to 1 turndown ratio. This design also allows the DynaDrive to have flexible terminal, or N, stage volumes within the same vessel. We're gathering the KLA data at various volumes within these reactors right now, and we'll have more data in the future. Here are some more images showing how the BPC is loaded in the 500 liter, and also on the far right, a CAD image of the lift mechanism used on the 3000 liter and 5000 liter DynaDrive reactors. This lift allows for BPC loading at ground level. Users will connect the BPC to the motor and also connect the corners to the top back and top front 
corners. The exhaust filters and, con and condenser are also on the lift mechanism. They will also connect a foam probe, pressure sensors, overlay gas, and an anti-foam feed tube through this lift mechanism. As discussed earlier, CFD, or computational fluid dynamics, and empirical data were used to determine the, the location, size, and shape of the impellers. We found that comparative mixing times improved when using three or more impellers when compared to using one impeller. You can see on that table that we saw that an improvement of about 62 times the comparative mixing performance when using three impellers as compared to one impeller. Now I'll move on to talk more about the shape of the DynaDrive reactors. We do get a lot of questions about the shape of the DynaDrive. The shape is square, or what we like to call cuboid. This was done on purpose. As you can imagine, we've been working on this for many years. The reason why it was done on purpose is that we found that we can get superior mixing and thus more efficient performance by utilizing this shape. As you can see on this slide, each vessel shape does have some advantages. Moving from left to right on this slide, the worst case is a centered cylindrical design, which can yield unidirectional flow and vortexing and ultimately uh, poor mixing times. The off-centered angled is what the legacy Thermo Fisher scientific bioreactors utilize. This is a good design, but it can cause some unidirectional flow and we recognized that this design is satisfactory for up to 2,000 liters, but it would not be possible to scale it up to 5,000 liters, and we needed to have a new design. Possibly the best design is a cylindrical shape with baffles, like you can see in this, like you see in stainless steel vessels. However, this design is difficult to do in single use, especially at large scale vessels. We would have had to put baffles in the BPC or or the vessel and expect the BPC to conform around the baffles without wrinkles and folds. That leads us to the cuboid design on the far right of this slide. The corners act as baffles and disrupt the flow patterns, therefore providing disrupted flow patterns and no vortexing formation. The impellers are also off-centered, which help with bulk fluid turnover within the reactor. All this leads to better mixing times and superior mass transfer performance. Speaking of mass transfer, as Merck mentioned, we are utilizing the drill hold sparge, or DHS, in all sizes of the DynaDrive. The DHS is not new. We introduced it in our single-use bioreactors in 2014. However, it has been enhanced with smaller but more holes, thus producing smaller bubbles, which improve the oxygen transfer rate, but also the bubbles are of proper size to strip the carbon dioxide. As shown by Merck, it has been proven that the DHS provides more than adequate oxygen transfer, but also strips the CO2 effectively as well. This performance is seen at all scales. The other benefit that was mentioned is that the DHS has linear performance as shown in the graph in the dark blue line. Fritz spargers provide a lot of oxygen mass transfer at low flow rates, but they plateau and are not linear. We definitely prefer the DHS, and we know you will as well. I've mentioned C-train turndown ratio a few times in this presentation. This slide shows the benefit of the turndown quite well. The top graphic shows a traditional C-train from vial to a 2,000 liter reactor with multiple steps in rockers and smaller reactors. Now if we compare that to the C-train of the DynaDrive from vial to flask, to a 50 liter and then to a 5,000 liter, you'll see that a lot of steps have been removed. This process has been done on numerous occasions with our test reactors and also by customers as well. It has proven to be very effective. You can see that this improved C-Train reduces the number of connection points, which reduces the risk of contamination and failures occurring. It also reduces labor and the number of consumables that are needed. It also reduces a lot of waste. Uh, it reduces it by more than two times. Not only does this re reduce the number of BPCs that are used for cell culture, but it also reduces the amount of uh, shipping and warehousing and packaging that is needed uh, for these BPCs. I now want to speak about examples that we have seen while using the DynaDrive. 
First, you just listened to Merck share their results and, and how they were able to exceed 200 million cells per milliliter in their perfusion process. We have also seen cultures exceed 300 million cells per milliliter by other users. We have demonstrated seeding a, a 50 liter DynaDrive directly from a high density cell bank vial. Also, there is a co-publication that we have done with Regeneron, which shows the CFD analysis comparing the 5,000 liter DynaDrive to the 2,000 liter legacy high performer single-use bioreactor and also to 10,000 liter stainless steel vessels. It definitely is worth a read and let us know if you need a copy of it. We will continue to collect and share more data throughout the coming months. We, we are collecting quite a bit of data right now for the KLA at all sizes and at different volumes and sparge rate of each size of the DynaDrive. That will be coming in our validation guide shortly. The data shown in this graph is preliminary, but I like to point out on the, the graph on the far left that we see, we're seeing KLA data from the 5,000 liter shown in gray and KLA data from the 50 liter DynaDrive shown in yellow and how the KLA data line up really well on top of each other. This performance gives us confidence that the process that you run at the 50 liter scale will scale up very nicely to the, even the 5,000 liter. We're able to get the same KLA performance on both sizes, as well as the 500 and the 3,000 liter. Also in this data set, we compare the KLA of the DynaDrive, the gray and yellow lines, to the KLA of our legacy 2,000 liter sub, shown in the blue line. So you can see that the DynaDrive has improved KLA performance over our legacy system, but it doesn't mean that it's overpowered. We can tune the DynaDrive by adjusting the flow rate through the spargers and, and get similar KLA that we see with our legacy reactors as well. So they offer a lot of flexibility to be able to meet the requirements of our legacy reactors as well as future requirements uh, for future processes as well. Other data that will be published in an application note soon is some cell culture data of two different Cho cell lines that we, we have cultured in the 50 liter 500 liter and 5,000 liter scales. The maximum cell density, viability, and titers match very well within all three sizes of reactors. And we're also very comparable when cultured in legacy reactors as well. Hopefully this presentation so far has given you a better understanding about the DynaDrive design and more about the key benefits that the DynaDrive offers. It's definitely more than a reactor that enables high cell density cultures as demonstrated by Merck, but it can be used effectively for fed batch processes and enables more unique and valuable advantages when compared to other reactors. So far, I've talked quite a bit about the technical benefits of the DynaDrive single-use bioreactor. I now want to talk briefly about some of the financial benefits of using these larger scale reactors as well. There was a special report published in Bioprocess International in October 2020, and we also had a webinar introducing the financial benefits of using the 3,000 liter and 5,000 liter vessels in November 2020. I just want to highlight a summary of our analysis when we uh, looked at the financial benefits of using these larger subs. Through our calculations, we found that users could see up to a 25% cost reduction in cost per gram when operating a series of 5,000 liter single-use bioreactors when compared to equivalent throughput from 2,000 liter single-use bioreactors. These cost savings are driven by reduced number of batches, reduced cycle times, and increased throughputs. Now, I wanted to just give you a little bit more insight into how we got to that calculation. This chart shows plant output in kilograms per year versus the number of reactors to achieve that output. The different colors of the lines represent the output based on different reactor sizes and quantity of those reactors. For example, the blue line is a typical 2,000 liter single-use bioreactor, and the DynaDrive is shown in the orange for the 3,000 liter and gray for the 5,000 liter. The yellow and green lines are stainless steel reactors. We chose to focus on comparing the throughput when operating six 2,000 liter reactors. 
when operating these six 2,000 liter reactors with a process that yields three grams per liter, a facility would be able to produce nearly 400 kilograms per year, as highlighted by the larger blue circle and the red box. And in, in order to produce equivalent amounts of material when operating a, a, the 3,000 liter, you need to have four 3,000 liter reactors, as shown in the large orange circle, or you could operate two or three of the 5,000 liter reactors, as shown in, with the gray circles. Or alternatively, uh, users could run a single 10,000 liter stainless steel clean in place or steam in place vessel, as shown by the larger yellow circles. Now, when you compare these different reactor volume equilibrated to target a throughput of 400 kilograms per year, we evaluated the cost. That's shown on this next slide. In the left graph, you can see that we have a 27% reduction in OPEX per kilogram per year when operating three 5,000 liter single-use bioreactors and comparing that to operating six 2,000 liter single-use bioreactors. And on the graph on the right, you can see that when you add in capital costs, and we assumed 1% weighted average cost of capital for eight years, we reduced the cost per gram by roughly 25% when making that same comparison of the 2,000 liter reactors to the 5,000 liter reactors. Or you can see a reduction in cost per gram by about 41% when you compare it to a single 10,000 liter stainless steel vessel. Um, and this, these calculations were based on complete facility build out, uh, includes both upstream and downstream, includes labor, material and consumable uh, estimations. And there's a lot more in that paper and that webinar that I talked about previously that, that goes into these calculations, but this is just a snapshot of how we got to those. Now, um, you know, these cost savings are extremely significant. So hopefully you've been able to see how the DynaDrive both technically and economically can bring you a lot of benefits and value as you consider this as an option for your next bioreactor needs. Uh, we, we truly believe in the DynaDrive, that it is the DynaDrive of the future, as exemplified by Merck. But we know that it has a lot more benefits than just what Merck talked about. You know, they talked about the intensified cell culture. But there's a lot more benefits that the DynaDrive brings as well. And hopefully you've been able to see some of those throughout my presentation. So this concludes my presentation. And I'll now turn it over to Leah for questions. Okay, great. So the first question is, you reported a drop in viability down to 80% at harvest. Is this a standard drop even with a cell bleed or do you attribute the loss to something related to the process or to the sub-performance such as agitation or sparging? So the process we were running in this evaluation was not an optimized process, but one constructed to quickly push the cell density high in order to evaluate the O2 transfer in the Drive. Yep, looked closely at the percent viability drop at this point, but we're not inclined to suspect that it is a result of sub-performance. Okay. And the DynaDrive specifies a significant turndown ratio, which I can see by being leveraged for running N1 and N stages in the same vessel, but I'm also interested in how much turndown ratio can be leveraged for N stage processes. With the geometry, there would be dramatic changes in liquid height at lower working volumes and fewer impellers submerged. What data has been generated to support a recommendation as to what portion of the turndown ratio can be leveraged for an end stage process? Yeah, this is a great question. We're planning on uh, publishing a validation guide uh, very soon, uh, by the end of March, so here just a few weeks away. And in that guide, we are uh, comparing the PIV and KLA performance at various uh, volumes within each reactor size uh, to be able to uh, show the performance uh, at different volumes. Um, right now, we're seeing that we get very similar performance uh, in those key cri criteria at about 50% of the volume and higher. So we do anticipate to have a turndown of about 50% um, or higher for each volume at the end stage. And so that gives a lot of flexibility, particularly if you think about the larger size systems, the 3K and the 5K, uh, you could operate at lower volumes uh, for your end stage performance and, and still get similar results at, at volumes uh, close to 50% the, the size of the reactor or higher. 
Okay. The next question is, I've always been skeptical of square tanks because of the obvious dead zones for mixing in the corners compared to cylindrical vessels, which have no absolute corners. What was your experience with any visible cell settling in the corners of the Dynadrive set? Thanks, that's a great question. Um, we actually did not observe any cell settling uh, in the corners of the Dynadrive or, or anywhere else during our two runs, and we were keeping a, a pretty close eye uh, on the bag, and it appeared very well mixed through all of our evaluation. And are there any new materials introduced in the Dynadrive BPC, and if so, what leachable and extractable testing has been done? What options do we have for pre-screening those materials with in-house cell lines? Yeah, this is a good question. There are some new materials introduced with the Dynadrive BPC, uh, the way that we had to construct the drivetrain with the impellers introduced some new materials. We have done l &E testing according to the BPOG protocols, uh, and we do have uh, those reports available uh, that we can share uh, under CDA with the uh, most customers and most users, and so we will be able to share those. Uh, also, we are working on um, a, a test kit, not only for uh, the DynaDrive, but also all of our BPCs that uh, would be a material selection test kit that you could run your uh, cell line in uh, prior to doing some testing and confirm that your cell line is compatible with the materials. So that, that test kit's not released yet, but that is something that we're working on. Um, and it should be released later this year uh, that would allow for some uh, pre-screening of the materials in-house. We've been doing some trial runs with it and it's looking very good um, to be able to screen cell lines. Uh, but so far to date, um, I don't know the exact number, but there's been somewhere about 50 different cell lines used with the DynaDrive. And for the most part, all of them have performed very well. Um, we have found a a limited number of cell lines that uh, seem to have some sensitivity at very low volume, like the 10 to 1 turndown ratio in the 50 liter um, that uh, have shown some sensitivity. For those, uh, we've recommended to maybe not utilize that 10 to 1 turndown uh, and, and utilize a higher turndown ratio, such, or sorry, lower turndown ratio like a 5 to 1 or 2 to 1, just to increase the uh, volume to surface interface uh, of some potential new materials that are there, but um, so far it's looking very good. Um, and uh, we've had very good success with all the cell lines we've tested. Okay, so it looks like we have time for just one more question. If we didn't get to your question, we will be passing all the questions submitted today along to our speakers, and they'll be able to follow up with you directly. The last question for the webcast is, the data you present suggests this sub is suitable for extreme processes such as high density perfusion or intensified fed batch. That seems a little over engineered for standard fed batch processes. Do you see limitations in your ability to run a lower density fed batch process, or would you sooner stick with legacy products instead of upgrading? Hi, thanks. Another great question. Um, while we did not do any specific fed batch runs during our evaluation, I don't see any limitation in an ability to run a lower density fed batch process uh, in the DynaDrive. Um, though our tests ultimately pushed to very high densities, we didn't observe any issues with control at the lower densities that we progressed through early in the evaluation. And I think there are advantages to having hardware that can support both types of processes, uh, especially if your pipeline has a mix of needs. And from what we saw, neither the hardware or the BPC of the DynaDrive would need any retrofitting to go between fed batch and perfusion. Um, if I were in a position solely working in fed batch, the option to stick with legacy products versus upgrading would be influenced by multiple factors, including the age of my existing hardware. But it's worth noting that there are features of the DynaDrive that we found advantageous that are not specific to high density culture. Um, two examples of that include the improved ergonomics of the bag loading and removal and that low point centered harvest drain, which allows for a high percent recovery of your volume without any significant manual intervention. Thanks, and thanks to our audience for joining us. The recorded version of this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website, and as a registered attendee, you'll receive a follow-up email providing you with a direct link. We look forward to having you join us at future Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. Look for those announcements in your inbox. Goodbye.